Terry Johnson, Public Information Officer. We're uh, starting the meeting in uh, Talkeetna here in a few minutes. audience for joining us. We'll get started here shortly. We're going to start uh, with a welcome from our public information officer, Kel Casey. We'll hear a message from our IC, Norm McDonald, operations update, fire weather and fire behavior. Um, thank you for your patience as we get started here. Again, we're in Talkeetna at the Upper Susitna Senior Center. Um, here's our public information officer, Kel Casey. And here's your agenda. Here's our agenda for today. Um, McKinley Fire Community. Is that clear? I'll let it hold for a minute so everybody can see it. And uh, once we post this video after we're done live on AK Fire Info, we will have all the attachments, including the agenda that was here today, and all the maps and handouts that we've included uh, for everyone that was able to make it in person because we don't want to let those. Um, of whom that could not make it be left out um, of all the information that we've given out. Um, today we have this Assuming the Hazards of Returning to the Active Fire Area handout. Um, it's going to be given out at the meeting as well as passed out um, and will be attached online when we post the video and all of the handouts. So um, this will be distributed today online uh, if you guys need access to these. Okay. Okay. Okay, everybody, uh, it's a few minutes after 10. We do have an online audience here joining us, and uh, we do want to keep the day going because I know all you have a lot to do. My name is Kale Casey. I'm the uh, lead information officer for the Alaska Interagency Incident Management Team. Uh, Norm McDonald, our incident commander. Our deputy incident commander, uh, Tom Kurth, was here on Wednesday when we had the evacuee meeting here, and then uh, our staff of about 50 on our team, 400 and something firefighters out in the line right now, and then all the supporting agencies and from the borough and the Red Cross and the, um, the assembly members are welcoming you here to join us. Um, I believe in a concept of extreme ownership and uh, that's a Navy SEAL principle. Um, I'll own the fact that uh, this was the first stop I made on the way down to my house uh, from Fairbanks to do a live feed on Monday night and then we had the meeting Wednesday. And then I'll take the fact that I didn't have the staff to necessarily be up here every day with a signboard like you would have liked. That's um, a challenge we have on fires when we only have a couple people in the first couple days. So as we get through this presentation, if there's a, um, a concern you have about how the communication went or uh, how you feel you were served, please take that up with me personally at the end of this. And um, we'll keep the questions at the end for the broad group. Okay, is that a good, good set of ground rules? Um, first off, some successes. 
Um, everybody needs to be aware of the highways opening two lane at noon. We also have 28% containment and the wind event from yesterday went over top. I'm not gonna take everybody's thunder, but these are three really important things to know right up front. The winds did come, but they went overhead, allowed us to stay in the offensive. And uh, the folks in the line right now are excited to keep pushing that uh, containment factor for you because um, we know you've been through it enough. I'm going to introduce Instant Commander uh, Tom, uh, sorry, uh, Norm McDonald. Tom and Norm are both uh, the, uh, Norm's the current Fire and Aviation Director for the State of Alaska with a 30 year career under his belt. And then Tom, who was here on Wednesday, was the former Fire and Aviation Director for the State of Alaska with 40 years under his belt. So it's an honor to work for these guys. They have a lot of experience and they live here. Norm McDonald. Warren, thanks for, for coming. Uh, I guess I want to start, let's go back to uh, Monday and how we got here. So, um, so first of all, my name is Norm McDonald, I'm the incident commander with the Alaska team. I, I live here in the Valley. I've been in, lived in Palmer for the last, uh, since the mid nineties. I've been, I was the FMO here since uh, 2005. So I've worked here for a long time. I was on Miller's Reach, uh, was the fire management officer for the area during Sockeye, and then now this one. So had what I call three once in a lifetime fires under my belt working right here in the valley. So we've been through this before. Um, you know, every I work, uh, Ken, Ken up here, Ken Barkley and I have worked together for a long time with the borough. Uh, we looked at, our team was mobilized on a Saturday. Uh, we were supposed to go down to the Swan Fire and this fire kicked off Saturday afternoon. Uh, Sunday we made the decision. We wanted the Alaska team here with that local experience uh, to be here for this community. Ed Soto is our agency administrator. He and I talked, and we felt this is the, the right place for this team to work with guys like Ken. We have that relationship and, and uh, stabilize that situation, get things back to as normal as we can, as quickly as we can. So uh, we, we came in on a Monday, uh, transferred with the local resources from Divisional Forestry in the borough. Um, by Monday evening, we were had owned this fire. We were had operational control. And on Tuesday, we started getting a lot of resources in from all over the, the state and the country. Uh, so to date, we have what is about 450 firefighters here on location. We got another five crews coming. That's another 100 folks coming in tomorrow. Uh, I think they're coming in from uh, Northwest and, and uh, Northern Rockies. So we've got help coming from all over the country to help this community out. At the same time, we're dealing with this fire. We also got the Swan Fire down in Kenai. Um, they've got about the same amount of people. They've got a type one incident management team out of Great Basin, so that Idaho country. Um, they've also got two additional fires down and out of Homer that are roughly about 100 acres and, and a lot of activity there the first couple days. And out in Southwest Alaska, there's another 5,000 acre fire that was uh, threatening a village out there that we've been dealing with as the Division of Forestry and the fire program in the state. So kind of set the tone from what we're dealing with starting on Saturday through the week. We had a lot going on a lot of fires, a lot of stuff threatened. Um, and we, we do is bring the resources in together that we need to, to be successful and we're able to do that. So we definitely had some challenges the first couple of days. Kale mentioned just a couple of them. Um, but some of the things that went really well is working very closely with the, with the Matsu Borough, um, getting folks in there, getting people, his people back to what they need to do is be ready for the next fire, that next start, that next structure fire, that next vehicle accident. And we're able to help him out and do that. He still has a bunch of people here helping us, um, but we were able to get those local resources back ready for that next start. Uh, the other group we worked with real closely was the tr uh, state troopers. They were there first shift helping with evacuations. Um, once we got that stabilized, they helped with the road access, egress along the parks. Um, once we, and also keeping those, uh, as we the evacuation order was in place, uh, just keeping those neighborhoods secure. So. Uh, Lieutenant Fussy and his folks have been here from day one with us. They've had is it, about 10 troopers, uh, day shift, night shift, uh, really helping out. So it's been a true interagency effort um, to help backfill his folks. We had the National Guard in. Uh, they help, they're on the roads. They're doing that, that uh, road opening and closing, helping with that process. And we've got the quality asphalt and paving on the local companies, helping with the signage and keeping that traffic safe. So um, what we do as a team, we come in to help the communities out help run the operations, but really we bring in all the groups that we need to to be successful and kind of coordinate that effort. And it's been a true interagency effort with a lot of different cooperators. So we've had uh, good success with that. And I can't say enough about how everybody comes together and works. That's the great thing about living in Alaska. Uh, it doesn't matter what agency you work for, what neighborhood you live in, uh, people come together, they help out and they, and they see it through. So it's been um, 
amazing to be part of that. And I've done this every summer for, for 30 years. Every time I see that, it's, it just kind of makes me, this is why I do it, this is why I like to do it. And this is, uh, you know, hopefully making, making um, things as normal as they can for the public who is in there. So, as I, you know, I work, work with these fires for a while, and I, you always see it, you get there, it's like the, the first couple of days of chaos, you're getting everything together. Um, you've got challenges, and we identify them. We set objectives for ourselves and priorities. And I think we're at the point of the fire now where we're starting to see some successes, having some victories. A big one is this afternoon, we're gonna get that highway open, that's two lanes. Um, the reason we had it shut down, or at least partially shut down, is firefighter and public safety. We feel we're at a point now where that smoke, which was a real issue early on, has diminished. Um, and then, so we feel at a place where that's step one of getting things back to somewhat normal. But the message is we still will have uh, speed re re uh, reductions out there. It's normally a 65, so we'll go down to a 45. Um, if we need to slow things down again, we have uh, folks out there that we can temporarily shut a lane down if we need to based on a, a flare up or a hot spot or something like that. Um, but our intent is to keep that highway open, keep that transportation corridor open, and, and, and kind of let that go back to normal. A second success we've had is with MMEA. They've done a really good job working with our firefighters. Uh, they got that main power line open down the highway uh, a couple days ago. Yesterday, they got the uh, uh, Hidden Hills line in, uh, back and activated, and every day they're getting more. So getting power back into those communities was a, was a priority of ours. So that's another success that we that we that we've that we're kind of getting to that point where that's starting to we're starting to see some some good things happen. Uh, in the near future, we're looking at tomorrow. Some point is lifting that level three evacuation, which that and, and trying to get people back into their their homes. Um, and there's going to be challenges with that. I'm going to tell you right now, um, that environment in there is still not 100% safe. So that's a struggle that I've had. Is like when's the right time to let people back in? Um, as again, as a lifetime Alaskan, I know I look at it, it's, it's coming up on September. People need to get back in there, evaluate their homes, assess the situation, see what they need to do to get ready for the winter. Because it's, I mean, that's coming quick. You guys know we got six to eight weeks before snow. And, and if you're trying to rebuild or get your, your place taken care of, uh, you got limited time frames. So it was a decision I made as the incident commander in conjunction with the borough and our agency administrators. Um, but I think it's the right one. So to do that, when we, when we actually lift that closure, uh, we're gonna have a lot of safety messaging that's gonna go out. People need to be aware there's still hazards. They include the hot spots, ash pits. We've had firefighters getting burns every day, stepping in hot ash. So people need to be aware that's out there. It's, if you got normal trails, you walk down in the woods, stay off those and stay in your footprint of your place. Uh, the power lines are, will be safe, but they're still out there. And if you get a wind and there's these trees that are coming down, that's a hazard. Got snags anytime we get a little bit of wind, there's still snags coming down. We've got firefighters working around houses trying to safe those, but be aware of that. So we'll send a list of the known hazards that we have, some mitigations, there'll be some contact numbers. So if it's a hazmat issue, you have somebody you can call about that. If it's a tree issue, you have somebody you can contact. Um, so again, it's not 100% safe, but we're gonna give people that information and as an Alaskan and an adult, you can make a decision what's best for you. If you've got a bunch of small children and pets, you might want to hold off and, it's, and, and wait for a while. But if you want to get in there and evaluate, it's an opportunity to do that. So we want to give you the best information we can so you can make that decision for yourself, knowing the hazards and the risks that are out there. And we're going to have firefighters here for a long time. I mean, this is going to be a, a long-term event. Um, it's not going to go away anytime soon. So there'll be people working around your neighborhoods and your homes while you're back in there trying to do your you're part of the recovery and assessing what you've got. Uh, I think we'll turn it over to our next speaker. So Great, thanks a okay. lot. We'll be here to answer questions if you've got anything. A lot of information there, right? You just heard a lot of things. So here's your, you have the hazard sheet. That's exactly what Incident Commander Norm McDonald's talking about. This is the re-entry hazards that are known and to be expected. It's not a safe environment. You have your agenda to be able to follow along with the speakers. And then please use your small map for this next presentation by Karen Schull, our operations chief. She's in charge of all the crews, the helicopters, engines, all the tactical side of everything out there. And when she refers to things, I don't want you to think you have to look up here because we've given each and every one of you your own individual map to look at and refer basically to what she's referring to up here. I'll introduce Karen Schull. Good morning, thanks for coming. 
glad to be here to talk to the folks about the status of the fire and what's going on out there. Um, as Norm mentioned, we've got uh, a lot of crews, a lot of resources from all over the states, uh, including local resources. And we're getting up to speed and up to basically a plateau where we're, we're looking pretty good. So we've got 15 crews out there. We've got uh, probably 25 engines, including borough assets that are still helping us. Uh, water tenders from local companies, local areas. We've got dozers now. We've got feller bunchers. So we've got a lot of stuff coming, and it's just taken a couple days to get them here. So we're up, we're up and feeling pretty good. Currently on the fire, you know, as you've been able to tell with the smoke production, it's a lot less. So the fire has calmed down. It's not progressing. It's not moving. Um, but we're not saying we have a really good grasp on it yet. Uh, it was a Good, great stroke yesterday. We didn't get the winds that were predicted. Um, that's twofold. It didn't test us, and but it also allowed us to continue to try and get around this thing. So uh, we do like to get wind tested at some point just to make sure that we have it while the resources are still here to be able to deal with anything should it occur. But uh, the fact that it didn't happen was also a relief because uh, we still have a tenuous hold. So it's kind of a double-edged sword there, but I think we're looking good. The black on the map are areas where we feel like the fire's been contained and it's not a real threat to get out. Um, we flew drones up here on the northwest corner on these spot fires out here. So we have drones that have infrared um, cameras on them and they can see um, not only the surface, but they can see into some of the tundra map because we do have such a uh, organic mat up here compared to the states. You know, we can't see into the dirt, but we can see a little bit into the tundra mat. So they did a good job. They flew over here and uh, took a look at these and uh, didn't find any heat that was threatening along the line. So that's really good. Crews are working in and around the Yancey neighborhood. There's a lot of uh, hazards still up there. There's tons of trees that we need to, to mitigate, hazards that need to come down so that they don't become a, a future threat for residents and uh, structures that are still remaining up in this area. We've got crews working along the northern edge uh, securing, securing this. Uh, this is holding, and it's looking real, real good for us. So it's less of a, um, a threat right now. Uh, we still have interior smokes and jackpots that will continue to, to flare up. Along this eastern line, uh, this has run into a riparian area, a more wet, moist area. We're going to get up with the drone today and take a look at that. Uh, we haven't had too many people here, but it has not moved. Uh, so. All things are indicating that we're, we're probably looking good on that northeastern flank. As we move down towards the center of the fire, we've got three crews working on this kind of pooch out here. This is all um, hand lines, so crews have to go in with saws to cut the trees, remove them, and then start mopping up, start putting plumbing in there, which is pumps and hose. Uh, this is not an area where we can put heavy equipment. Uh, there have been a lot of offers for heavy equipment to come and help out, and those are much appreciated, but we've got what we need where we can utilize them. So this is all hand crew work. Uh, they're just about around it and with plumbing and uh, with the hand line, so it's looking good. Fire didn't move yesterday. It hasn't been bucking us, so we're, we're feeling pretty, fairly confident on this uh, action, and over the next couple of days, we'll see more black on the line on the map indicating that we're, we're feeling pretty good about it. As we move south, we have a mix of dozer line and hand line all the way along the eastern flank. We've got crews, dozers in there. We're getting some feller bunchers in the mix and uh, putting, putting equipment where we can because they're just, they move faster than hand crews. But then there are a lot of areas where we can't put the equipment and we're, we're using hand crews. So we were able to bolster uh, what that division is working with uh, down there with additional hand crews <coughs> yesterday, and we're getting some more tomorrow. So um, things are looking pretty good over here on the eastern flank. Coming up on the west side, it's kind of basically the same story all along the western flank. Uh, a mix of hand crews and heavy equipment, putting the line in and getting hose in behind it so we can really secure it and hold it. We are a little thin right now, but we, with the additional crews coming tomorrow, we should be looking really good there. The 
fire is still going to be burning. It's still going to be producing smoke. We're still going to have uh, flare-ups with the jack straw. So what we call jack straw or blowdown. The roots get burned out. Our roots here are not very deep because we're over permafrost most of the time. So a tree that would typically uh, require a lot of wind or a lot of effort to blow over, it doesn't take much now. So in the fire area, all these trees, uh, the tundra mat's been burned, or burned away. And so a tree will just tip silently in the forest without any notification. So that's our big hazard that we are really concerned about. Typically, we like to pick up at the origin of a fire. We call it the heel. And we like to go along the sides and make a concerted effort to get around a fire and pinch it off at the head. With this fire, we have not been able to, to, to deal with this fire in that manner. Um, and so our, our work is getting kind of scattered. We get a lot of calls because we have interior, we have a bunch of structures, homes, uh, outbuildings, uh, flare-ups, jack straw, so something will flare up and we'll send our, some of our forces over there to make sure that we're not in, uh, impacting any existing structures. So we've been pulled in lots of different directions. It's kind of slowed our production down but we realized the value of the structures within the burned area and we need to make that a primary focus of us of this while also trying to keep the fire from growing. So we've had a big task. Uh, we've done really well. Um, we're happy to, to go and, and ensure that what people are calling in about is not actually a factor, but we do get a lot of calls that are like, ah, oh, there's a flare up. And we go and check it out and it's in the middle of a, a black area. It looks, uh, probably scary to an untrained eye and then our folks are able to verify whether that's something we need to take action on or we just let it burn out. Um, easiest way to deal with stuff in the interior smokes and jackpots in the interior of the fire is just to let them burn out. Um, let them burn out, let the trees fall over and we'll work our way into them as we move into the next phase which is the mop up phase. So once we get around the fire uh, we'll start mopping up and we'll start progressing interior. And while that's happening, and that's just for the wildland stuff, the structure stuff, we're still working on that. We still have engines patrolling the neighborhoods, looking for flare-ups, trying to put out hot spots, and also move into that hazard reduction phase. So the hazard reduction is very time consuming. We have to evaluate the trees all around properties. We have to be able to fell them safely so that uh, we can allow access back in. Um, so this. This event tomorrow of letting folks back in is, uh, it's very nerve wracking for our firefighters because we know that it's not a safe environment. It's not a safe environment for our firefighters and it's not a safe environment for, for the public to come back in. However, we realize the need and uh, we want to accommodate that, but we just, we want you to be re very real about the hazards that still exist around homes. So like Ta um, uh, Norm had mentioned is we want to stay on the footprints of existing, um, a tree can fall over uh, behind you if you go down a, a driveway or down a road. Perhaps later in the day, if we get any kind of a breeze, a tree could fall behind you. Um, it's uh, we're and if we are having to chase those calls to cut you out so you can come back out, then that takes away from our ability to continue our progress. So. Just think about those things when you make the decision on whether that's right for you guys to move uh, back into your neighborhoods. Uh, we're here to help, but we also have you know, the, big, the big picture is to try and work inside, out, and then along the outside of it to get everybody back into their homes. Um, I think that's about it for, uh, for the status of the, the fire currently. Great, thanks Karen. We'll have questions for Karen at the end. Um, you'll see on your agenda next is, is Mark Lothelbeam with the incendiologist, and, and then after him is Chris Moore. Chris Moore is actually down with the cooperator meeting this morning, so Mark will cover both the weather and a little bit of fire behavior. Mark. Well, good morning. The, I'll start off with just today's weather. Right now we're looking at a mostly cloudy sky outside. I do expect that to break up a little bit for a while this afternoon, but for the most part, those clouds will be coming back this afternoon. I do have some sprinkles in the forecast. I don't feel it's going to be any more than that. Mainly it will stay in the terrain around us. If we get anything, it'll be between 6 p.m. and midnight tonight. 
but at most it's going to be like the other night we had some raindrops fall and you could walk between them. There wasn't enough to make a difference. So I don't think we're going to see any appreciable rain. However, on this matrix right here, down here, the chance of wetting rain, 10%. I did put a, enough in there that we might get a rain shower to sit over the fire long enough to be measurable, but at 10%, that's pretty minimal. I just don't feel like we have enough moisture in the air to really do much for us. Now, the big thing that we uh, saw yesterday was that potential of some uh, winds. We had the winds in the forecast yesterday um, that were uh, at 15 miles per hour. They ended up being at 9 miles per hour. We had those winds early on in the morning. We could see them on the profiler up here. They were up above us. However, with the air likes to uh, settle. The atmosphere likes to settle like oil and water. We had the coldest air settle in the valley, and that protected us from those stronger winds that we could see on the instrumentation up above us. And then once we mixed out that inversion and started to get into those stronger winds a lot, they were starting to taper off. So they weren't any longer a, much of a threat to us. In the end, nine miles per hour was measured. So there was a little bit of a northerly wind there for us, but uh, fortunately missed those strongest winds, which were in the morning. Now this is our, our, what we call our forecast matrix. And what we do is we try to relate to, uh, weather to fire behavior, which is the whole point of me being here, is I work with that fire behavior analyst and how is that weather going to uh, affect fire behavior. We see a lot of green showing up today, which is good. That cloud cover, we uh, are interested in that and how that's going to uh, affect the fuels. We'll hear about probability of ignition a lot, and we hear about shaded and unshaded. It does make a difference whether or not you're getting direct su uh, sunlight on those fuels, and that cloud cover is going to help us for today. Temperature is a little bit cooler than yesterday. We got near 70 yesterday mid-60s for its day. That 20-foot wind, that's what I'm concerned about. That's why you see a yellow here and a yellow in the active here. That wind's going to turn to the south, pick up to 10 miles per hour. That is a, a bit of a change for us, but that southerly wind is hopefully going to bring in some more humidity with it, and we won't dry out as much. So we talk about relative humidity, and that also is going to be right around 40%, which is considerably higher than yesterday's, which was in the mid-20s. So that's going to be a bit of a change for us as well. Um, after today, uh, things uh, start to get kind of stagnant here. I'll talk about Groundhog Day, and as a meteorologist, it's kind of fitting, it's Groundhog Day, but it, it just continues very similar conditions. What we have happening is high pressure just kind of building into the, the central portion of Alaska, and that's going to control a lot of our weather. We will have low pressures going by a, along the southern Alaskan coast, and also some around uh, the northern portion of Alaska. So with those two not too far away, it is a possibility one of those will swing through and change their weather just a little bit over the next five to seven days. But when I was looking at things this morning, the next time I actually saw something that might produce rain uh, would have been next weekend. And that's still pretty far out. I always say in Alaska, as a meteorologist, I'm, I'm very rarely can I have much confidence beyond four days. Uh, things just move around the pole too fast for us to really have good confidence beyond that. But on a larger scale, I just don't see anything moving through at least for the next week. Um, I will stick around after this if anybody's have any questions for me. Great, thanks Mark. Okay, up next, and again, uh, Mark is uh, one of those experts we really rely on, and um, just from a firefighting standpoint, this is about as good as news as it gets for being on the offensive. So if you're wondering, uh, for those of you on the live feed have been asking us, will this fire make a run down to the sockeye, or do people in the level twos and ones have anything to worry about this weekend? I think Mark just painted that picture for you, and Karen too. We are holding this fire in the footprint that it is right now and has been for the last four or five days. Is that clear to everybody? We have been holding the fire in the footprint. The acreage has been actually decreasing due to more accurate mapping. So earlier in the week, we were at 4,200 acres. Then it bumped down with more accurate mapping to about 3,700. Right now, if you look at your map closely, it says 3,300 and something. So that's that, that footprint here. And I just don't want you to leave mentally here thinking this fire is moving out of its footprint anytime soon. We are in a really good place to hold it where it is. Next up is Ken Barkley, our emergency services uh, director, and he'll be able to give us an insight into his uh, leader's intent for how, how this all went down, and he's been with us from day one. I mean, we, we don't operate without you being in right with us, so thank, thank you. you. Thank you. So I really appreciate everybody's patience uh, with us. This is uh, one of the driest, uh, fast-moving fires we've seen in a very long time. These conditions in Alaska we've never seen before, and I'm talking about a lot of experience here, and um, the depth of the dryness and the trees are just falling over. They have nothing to do with the fire. They may not be involved in the fire, and they're falling over, and that's been the biggest concern of us for the firefighters 
those that didn't evacuate, and those that are trying to get back into their house. It's the trees that's our biggest hazard, other than the highway. So th these are the factors that we're just not used to. We don't have these dry conditions that deep in the ground. I think, Kale, if I remember right, you were digging a, ho a hole and you hit frost. So in May, May 5th, we had our first call. Remember, Norm McDonald called. We had to go to Delta Junction for a bombing range fire. And I was trying to dig four inches in Willow to get my dog fence in so I could get my puppies outside before my fiance kicked my butt for leaving right away with the puppies. And four inches below the surface of Willow was ice. May 5th, 2019. Now, how now you can take an excavator, <laughs> you can dig into my yard, you can pick up which is happening because I'm burying some stuff that I actually shouldn't say out loud from the sockeye fire. <laughs> and, um, and now it's a moon dust, right? So everything is moon dust. You dig into the soil right now, you can go down 30 something inches, pick it up, and it's dust everywhere. So we've never experienced this before. So this is a lot of the problem. And I know I was talking to um, uh, Ed, or uh, Ned Sparks, I'm sorry, um, earlier about trying to get information on people's homes. And we had to get the uh, fire marshals in there to look at you know, which homes were lost. And it was very difficult and dangerous for them. They went in a few times and they had to come back out. It was just too dangerous to, to go in. Uh, Lieutenant Fussy, if I'm correct, we had to give the troopers chainsaws. Was that correct earlier yeah, on? And that was just because the trees, when they would go in, they couldn't get back out. The trees were blocking the driveways and the roads to come back out. It was just something we haven't experienced before. So we had to ensure that they could get out as well. So, so we appreciate your patience. Um, we got some good news coming. I'm not gonna steal Bill. I believe he's gonna, Bill from Red Cross will talk about in a little bit about where do we go from here? What, what happens next? So um, he'll, he'll talk to you about what we can do um, I will tell you, the borough manager, the deputy manager, our assembly members, Tam Bobi, I don't think there's, I was going to say a day we haven't talked, I'll say three hours hasn't gone by, and I don't care what time it is, we have talked. So um, believe me, they are engaged and they care about their community. Uh, troopers, um, uh, they've just been outstanding. Uh, we have, we've had more troopers in this area than we've had in all of Alaska, I think it's sometimes, just 24-7. They haven't left. They haven't left us at all. They've been here since day one, and they haven't left. Uh, Captain April and Lieutenant Fussy, I've been working with them from day one, so I know they haven't left. So, so we've got a lot of help here, so I appreciate it. And uh, we have some plans for the next couple days for you that, that are looking a little more, more promising. Thank you. Okay, thanks again. Okay. And again, questions at the end. So Assembly Member Tam Bowie, also my neighbor who lives right up from me at mile post 74. Tam, it's all yours. And thanks to Byron, by the way, for the deaf community and everybody online. We like to have ASL here, and Rachel and Byron, thank you too. Thank you, Kim. My name's Tam Bovey. I'm the Medsu Borough Assembly representative for this district. I'm going to reiterate a little bit of what was said before and add a couple of my own comments. Um, first of all, thank you everyone for your patience. I know a lot of you left your property and have been living elsewhere for the last week plus. I, I know it hasn't been easy. Um, my family evacuated during Sakai. Um, what, it, it takes years to recover from an event like this and, and um, I, I feel your pain. Um, I also understand that this has kind of been a waiting period for everyone, waiting to get more information, waiting to get back on your property, waiting to get going. Um, things are gonna start to get really busy now. Um, we do, we have that two months, give or take, window before winter hits. So we're gonna be throwing a lot of information out at you. If it's at all possible, try to get online. Try to get on the borough's webpage, get on the alaskafireinfo.com. Um, for those of you who can't, find a neighbor who can. Go to the library, whatever your options are there. Um, we'll also push out information through KTNA. So if you have a radio, um, please, this is going to be uh, resources that will become available as, as we get the debris cleanup options going. Just anything to help you guys do what you need to do. There are literally thousands of people working right now, um, some at the fire, most of them behind the scenes, trying to get you the help, the resources, everything we need to get this moving forward. Um, I cannot begin to thank them all. I'm going to just shout out to three in particular, the Talkeetna, the Caswell, and the Willow Fire Departments. 
These people are absolutely amazing. Some of them lost their own home, um, and they're still out there. They're working round the clock, uh, supporting the forestry team, and, and working these smaller incidents to prevent another a large incident. Um, along that line, I want to remind you the fire danger is still high. Four wheelers, chainsaws, generators, all these things we're going to be using. But let's, let's be really careful. Let's not spark another fire. Um, just to uh, explain a little bit for those of you who don't know what my role is, I do work for the Metsu Borough. My job is to make sure that all of these agencies right now that are trying to help you understand exactly what we need up here. There are some unique situations. Um, we're not like other areas of Alaska. We're not like other areas of the Metsu Borough. Um, we're, we're a tough, self-sufficient breed, but you know we've taken a hard hit. So if there's something you need, please reach out to me. I will do my best to make sure that these agencies understand and, and that we get the help we need up here. Um, as you go back on your properties, please, please be careful. Please be safe. Thank you. All right, thanks, Pam. <laughs> and next up, um, I know we're kind of moving quickly here, but then we'll get to Q&A. Bill Morrow with the Matsu Disaster Red Cross. He's going to speak on behalf of the Red Cross, and that will actually then turn into a Q&A. So, Bill, you have the floor. Thank you, Dan. Uh, thank you all. Good morning. My name is Bill Morrow, and I'm a resident of the Matsu Borough, and I work for the American Red Cross. We have uh, quite a few Red Cross workers here, and some of them even came from the lower 48 to help out. Mm -hmm. We're going to be here to support you as long as we need to be here, and we're going to continue to do that. Uh, moving forward today from noon till 6, there will be some caseworkers here from, from the Red Cross, and they will sit down. If you want to sit down with a caseworker, you'll have that opportunity uh, beginning tomorrow. We will be uh, distributing some emergency supplies, which consists of cleanup kits. We'll have some shovels, some brooms, uh, and some uh, gloves, some masks available for you. And you're welcome to take those. We'll have some other items as well that you're welcome to. And we're going to try to support you. I want to thank so much the uh, Senior Center here and the uh, food bank, uh, the uh, Sunshine Food Bank for all the hard work they've done. And I just want you to know <clears throat> that the American Red Cross, <clears throat> excuse me, will be here as long as we need to be to support you. We want you to be safe when you go back home. Anything that we can do for you, we're gonna try to take care of that if you let us know. And uh, we just, if you feel that when you get home, you're not safe, please understand you're gonna have a place to come back to uh, the Menard is also going to be uh, remain open as long as we need to. We're going to be here. Okay, great. Thanks, Bill. Um, for the online audience, and we're looking for your questions too. On the back of your um, hazard sheet is a fire information number that rings right at my unit in Willow, where we have our command post, as well as an email. There's also the links to the online information. Uh, we definitely appreciate the way neighbors are helping neighbors get information around, so let's spread the right information around, and let's open up the questions for the good of the order, the broad, the broad questions, and then we can have the breakouts and uh, individual uh, specific questions about your property. Yes, ma'am, in the back. I just want to let you know that the Southern Baptists are up the parking lot, free showers, free laundry service today and tomorrow. Please take advantage of that if you don't have power. Okay, great. So repeat that for the online audience. Uh, they have a shower unit. I saw it on the just outside the building here, hot showers and other needs that you might have in the community. If you're not here, come on in and, and use the facilities here and, and that's for you. Okay, questions? Yes, ma'am. Oh, sorry. Uh, I need Bill's gonna, he's gonna, there's a few things oh, we talk about real quick. We have, in fire uh, break it down terminology, which we try to do for you, the straight talk, it's called a go back. So Bill <laughs> is requesting a go back. Should we, <laughs> should we allow him a go back? Yeah. Yes. Okay, Bill, you gotta go back. Thank you. Uh, Bill has some senior moments every now and then. <laughs> <laughs> so what I failed to say is the plan from here on, like I said, we're going to be here to support you, and the uh, food bank is going to be here to support you. The senior center, we're not going anywhere. You'll be able to get a meal moving forward. 
uh, as long, and I know at least up through next week, and then we can take a look at it if we need to go further. We will, but at least up through next week, that's our plan to be here to assist you. And I know that the food bank is going to be here to assist you, and uh, and the senior center is here, and we're going to support their efforts in every way that we possibly can. Okay, thanks, Bill. Maybe hang right there, because if I were to play this out in my mind, knowing some of the concerns people have had and some of the pent-up sort of feeling of, okay, so what happened with maybe the miscommunication or why was there the perception the Red Cross was leaving? Sometimes in these large operations, we also have other operations going on around the state, so it, it takes a, a lot of people, it takes a lot of decisions, and sometimes things do get miscommunicated or misunderstood and basically that's all it was never and we, we just there's no ever no intent to pull out and leave you folks without any resources I promise you that okay so to reiterate it looks like the cross is here through the week that's firm and sure. then indefinitely in terms of other services so it looks like the meals the showers all the support network here let's assume re-entry I think Norm just sort of, we always like to set you up for success in terms of our information flow. I believe Instant Commander Norm McDonald, McDonald sort of gave you the test answer question that early this week is re-entry. You guys all kind of hear that in the intro? Okay, so assuming that's what's happening, head nodding, then that means that after re-entry would be still support here by the Red Cross. Is that what we all heard Bill say? Absolutely. Okay, so we're all on the same page. The Red Cross will be here for meals, shower, support, even after re-entry for a number of days. We all on the same page? Okay, good. Yes, ma'am. Well, I want to add another thing too. The doctors are partnered with us as well. With sisters, you really need to know and understand how to use those. There's toxic stuff in what you're going to be sifting through in your homes. They have classes to teach you how to use those properly so you don't harm yourself even more. Okay, so, so again. Uh, with with them, great. Red Cross volunteer in the back. And the Red Cross has an enormous amount of experience. We do this professionally, and so we're always in this sort of re-entry. The cleanup kits, that's a standard part of having a, a freezer that got unplugged, and, and gosh darn it, it breaks your heart, and there's tens of thousands of dollars of your game in there, but now it's toxic if it's melted or, and, and, and gone bad, right? So these cleanup kits are for, for those type of purposes. These sifters that they're talking about, on your property when things burn down, whether it's an outbuilding with your tools and chemicals and such. And so the Red Cross really are subject matter experts in this recovery piece. We encourage you to ask them questions and they have these type of tools for you to use. Okay, other questions? Yes, ma'am. How is this gonna affect the wells? How is this gonna affect the wells? Meaning your water mm -hmm. supply or in terms of if we have any, because I have had online questions about the retardant and wells, that's normally we don't have that issue in terms of penetration that deep into the water um, uh, table, right? Wells around this area are generally in the 70 to 100 plus foot range. My well and well is 89 feet, Griffin did it. Wells, okay, so normally retardant doesn't impact that. Are you talking about the lack of water in the, uh, in the area? Have any locals run out of water yet? Right, okay. The, okay, right, this, uh, the spring on the side, right, where I go to, mile marker 89? Okay, that hasn't been impacted. In fact, with the two-way traffic now, you'll be able to pull off in that pullout like a normal civilian and fill up your water jugs. But how is that, has that been tested to make sure that all of the stuff is being dropped? I can't say okay, yes or no to that. Okay. But I'm going to fill up my jug on the way home. Right. How about that? <laughs> okay? Yeah, because I need that water too. I don't drink my well water. Like a lot of you, but I use this for the. <laughs> okay, okay, questions. And, yes, and Jeff, of course, of course. So, as we're starting to wake up here, sorry, a lot of us haven't had a lot of sleep. So, the other part of this is, what do we do with all the debris, the hazmat, the the household stuff, the freezers, the, the tin, the metals, all that. Right now, uh, hopefully by tomorrow, we'll have the plan in place. All the normal uh, sites that we can take things to will be open. But what we're going to try to do, and I've been working with Assembly Member Bovey about it, is uh, on Sakai we brought in huge dumpsters and then we had a big gravel pit where you can bring all that at no charge. So that's what we're working on right now. Uh, Monday we're going to put that plan together and I'm hoping that the very latest Wednesday it will be in effect. Uh, I talked to our emergency manager, Casey Cook, 
And I said Friday. He said, no, we can do it a lot sooner than that. So we will get that information out to you. There'll be flyers put out. We're going to put them online. We've already put them out, but they're just uh, preliminary. We're working on expanding those locations. So it won't be any cost to you to bring all the household stuff that you need to dispose of to these sites, whether it's dumpsters or gravel pits. So I just want to assure you we will be taking care of that. Hopefully by Wednesday we'll have all that in place and you'll know where to bring everything. Okay? Thank okay. you. More questions? Yes, sir, in the back. Yes, good morning. Uh, thank you for being here. Um, you talked very briefly on the power restoration through the corridor. Um, is that information, like Highway Park or 84, how do we know where that information is? Where are we going to get power back into that particular section? Who makes that decision? Okay, great question. And Julie Etsty from MEA could not be here today, and she texted me that they have been beefing up all the information on their web page with those type of answers and their Facebook page. But the way that Greg's process was, and uh, Norm or anybody else who has those inner circle can jump in on this, but the way, and we put a video up for you uh, about three days ago with Greg, put them on the spot, by the way. These are kind of unscripted. We rope them into our transparency campaign. He's like, well, I guess I can do it. So Mainline got energized. That was a success overnight two or three days ago. Then they have the side taps. Some of those are underground and can be impacted. So they, they didn't know you can't do one without the other. You have to do one to then know what the others are. Well, the Hidden Hills one is up. So that's a huge side tap they've been worried about. They're, the lights came on at Sheep Creek Lodge uh, right when that first main line came down. So they, MEA has every vested interest in every way possible to get you power. And of course, once your power is turning, it gets you know, their stakeholders back in the game of where they need to be with full capacity. She did say they're waiving every kind of fee possible if you have had damage on your property, whether it's a meter or what have you, that all those type of fire impact damages will be waived. And so for a process question, it's just the, you know, these line people work really hard and, and Karen's out there organizing all the safety of it and everything else. So I can speak to what they're working on today. So the main line from about Caswell's north was energized uh, and then into Hidden uh, Hills Road. South of Caswell's, they're working on that. It, they're anticipating the main line, the backbone, a couple of days, uh, three to four days to get everything to the south back on. So that's kind of the time frame if you live uh, south of 88 down to 82 mile, uh, somewhere around there. So anticipate a couple of days, but again, the best uh, resource is the, the bro or the MEA site. I know most people want power to their place, but Personally, we have just a crazy tuner box of our drive that we haven't been able to get um, quite who, who. We have the wire taken out by MEA, but they're the ones that cut all the trees, but there's still tons of trees that are just, you know, covering the drive constantly. And I don't know if someone can help us kind of figure that out, because they've been coming trying to figure out how to get power, but <laughs> we don't want power there, because it's going to be, it's not safe right now. Repeat that question real quick. For the online audience, you have a homeowner who has an enormous amount of fire weakened trees, which is not uncommon. We put some drone footage up so you could see just the sheer quantity. And she knows that if the power line were to be strung to her house right now, that it would only last a matter of the next tree taking it down. So she's looking for that next level resource. Yeah, we're, we've got uh, folks from the fire working directly with MEA, and we can go the offline. And, uh, yeah, we talked to them. Yeah. Great, so that's one of those specific, after we call it a tie-in. Mm -hmm. So in fire slang, when two people meet up face to face, that's called tying in. So you'll tie in afterwards, just like if you have any concerns with the information flow, you'll tie in with me afterwards. I think you just make this stuff up. <laughs> <laughs> we have a lot of lingo. We've always been, we've always been uh, sort of chastised for using our lingo, so I decided why not just tell you our lingo, and then you'll know, hey, let's tie in afterwards. We all get that. Yes, sir. Fifty-one primaries. Fifty-one primaries that have to be rebuilt. So I'll repeat the question. Gentleman in the back asked, 
Uh, just in general, up here in this direction, we're mile marker 99 here at the Talkeetna Turn. It's hard to get contractors and uh, regular at a regular time of year, let alone when there's structure loss. So, can there be a, um, a contractor pool where people can reach out and get some rebuilding help? So we have the same issue because we use a lot of contractors for the for our suppression part of it, the dozers, excavators. I think the brothers, the Matsu Builders Association, maybe that's something we can work with. I was just talking to Ed on the way up here how hard it is to get the local equipment and excavators here quickly and they live right here in the valley so maybe we can work together on getting that list because we're going to do that for the fire side of it but it would also be carryover to share with the public all the companies and, and what they provide so we we'll, can we'll get that on the website good good question that would be, that would be great. you yeah. bet and we'll put the low tech side of that on the signboard once we get it so that signboard will stay there we always try to balance the high tech with the low tech and the reason why I couldn't have an information officer here every day until Thursday was we didn't have the bodies to do the low tech, but we could certainly give you the high tech and we did our best. Questions? I have yeah. a couple questions. Yes, ma'am. Um, for one, um, I've heard rumor, I've been working a lot of hours and then I check on my friend's places on the way home and I live in Canada. Couple questions. I heard that if somebody starts to rebuild before FEMA steps in and helps them out, but they will not get any help. Is that true? So, so question number one is, if somebody starts to rebuild before FEMA steps in, they won't get any help. And I'll go ahead and pass that over to Ken. There's, I'm sure the preliminary answer depends on what category you fall on of insurance and what have you. Right. So we're going to have uh, folks come up here, hopefully by tomorrow, to answer those questions, because it's different between which Who's funding us right now? Right now, FEMA is not. The state is. That that declaration was signed um, two days ago, Tom? Three, two? Oh, no, a couple days ago. So the state is funding now. So what that does, it opens up funds for your clothing, um, food, and shelter. They'll, they'll get you apartments, and up to a year it can go longer, but, but generally it's up to about a year that they'll be taking care of you on that side of what, what we have now. Now we're pushing further with the governor who is in support of this and the uh, mayor that we're going to try to get FEMA involved. Once FEMA gets involved, then it goes into a different category on, on helping with the homes. That's where we're at right now. We don't have the FEMA approval, but we are pushing to get that. So state will support it right now. But is it true that if somebody starts rebuilding before they step in that they will not? I have help? not heard that, but I will okay. find out. Um, right now, what we have for state is not to build your house, but to take care of you. The FEMA is where it helps you build your house, and I will have to refer to them, but uh, we'll get you that answer. Okay? Before you leave, if you give me your information, I'll make sure I get that. And actually, we can also push it on the website yep. as well. Okay. Hey, you bet. Really good question. You had another yeah, piece of question? Yeah, um, I've been driving a pilot car at night. Um, like I said, I um, live in Caswell. Um, I was there the day that broke loose so to speak um, and um, trying to turn around traffic and fires on both sides um, was insane we had tankers that were loaded with flammable fuel that we had to get through because traffic would pull over when you turn them around they pull over on the southbound side and take pictures and videos traffic control is, is so extremely important um, I've been driving, like I said, at night. Um, it's great during the day. There's not much smoke. When there is, you can still see at night. You can't, visibility is almost non-existent. We've got our fire crews out there and MEA who are doing a hell of a job, the troopers, but they will have no protection. Our people that are out there trying to protect their homes will have no protection. I, I've been told, but I don't know if this is true, um, they're pulling us out, pulling traffic control out today. The only traffic control, we put um, our candles back on the passing lanes at 86, 87 mile, so that the fire crews there will have access to places on the side. Um, we'll have two flaggers, one at Sheep Creek Lodge and one at Audubon, 24 hours, so we'll have two crews working 12 hours each. Um, at night, there's no visibility. I drive through there and Thank God the lights are on at Sheep Creek, but sometimes you can't even see those. 
our fire crews are out there, they don't turn around fast, and you've got people going way over the speed limit. You've got people thinking, I know this road like the back of my hand. I've lived here for a long time. I've driven a pilot car here doing construction and now through the fires. I know the road like the back of my hand, but when I'm calling in fires, while you crews are actually working on fires that you see, I call in the big fires. And I have to try to remember where in the hell am I at? Pardon my French, where am I at? So that I can tell people to come help. Because I have friends out there trying to sleep at night because they're working so hard to see their places. And I worry about them. And I worry about you guys out there. I definitely appreciate the concern for the online audience. Uh, the, the, the person who's been giving this beautiful, heartfelt concern for us is a pilot driver. So she's been out here at night and she knows the concerns of the road. I'm going to have Norm kind of uh, give us all again the plan for this flagger operation because the reason why so many emotions are involved is that uh, firefighters die by motor vehicle accident uh, more often than people think. It's one of the leading causes of death of firefighters on the fire line is actually MVAs, rollovers, accidents, those type of situations, smoke, the, the twist engine a few years ago, NG57 in California a few years ago, those type of events. And uh, your concern is incredibly heartfelt and, and appreciated. And Norm, if you could address kind of our plan again for the road and, uh, and what's going to be the operational next 24 hour period in that. Sure. So, I mean, for us, the, our number one priority is firefighter and public safety. That's for every incident, that's the first thing we look at. So, when we looked at opening that road up to two way traffic, it was a two day process where we worked with the troopers. Uh, we talked to your supervisor with quality hospital. Uh, QAP and then our, we have safety officers who were out there all day yesterday looking at the options where our, uh, our pinch points would be where we had hazards and how we we're going to address it so it, it was not just a quick let's do it uh, let's, let's just make this happen it's been well thought out and we worked with Karen and uh, you know the flare-ups that people see along the side of the road although like she mentioned can seem very dramatic if you're not little ones, but they're big ones I call them in with the and, and, and we have right so we have people out there at night to deal with them but a lot of those are interior so although there's there's fire um, it's not when you look at the weather we're, we we are out of that at this time where we're gonna have a running fire like we did last week we don't have the 30 mile an hour winds um, it's cooler the days are getting shorter the nights are getting cooler the humidities are coming up so we feel we're in a place where with the fire behavior we are comfortable to do that. So we talked about the firefighter safety as our number one priority. Another one on our list is is access is that those public corridors, the railroad and the parks highway, and that's the is the lifeline between Anchorage and Fairbanks. There's the tourist bus. Uh, it affects the, having that that highway closed like it was it would affect the kids going back to school. Um, and what just about a shorter pilot car line for the eve for <coughs> night time, like 9 p.m. to 9 a.m. Where well, and if when we it's need so smoke if, filled in there, if we need to, we can reevaluate. Our night, night shift is out there. They, that guy's been out there every day, and uh, you know he's. We talked to everybody who's working out there, and he's been there from day one on the night shift, and he feels comfortable with that situation. So, um, you know, the, one of the things we got to do is really just ask the public to adhere to those speed limit signs, reduce speed. We have the signs out there. We have the, the flaggers out there. We have our folks with overheads out there. Um, but also, it's a way to get things back to normal, and that was one of our priorities, getting that, that highway. To keep that shut down like it was, those kids aren't getting to school. So I mean, we take all that into account and look at mitigations we could use to make it safe, and we've done that. So, I mean, at this point, I feel comfortable with, with that, and we'll evaluate it daily. If we need to adjust something, we can do that. Uh, we talked to Lieutenant Fussy. He's going to have the, the local patrol you know, post up there at the, at the high hours so, that, so people will see that, the high vis. So I think we're at a place where we can do that and do it safely. And it's something we'll just continue to evaluate. I mean, every day we'll look at it. If we need to do something different, we will. And are our National Guard and troopers being pulled out? The troopers are, are they're, they're not, they're going, they brought in, and maybe you can talk, talk a little bit about that, Paul. Thanks, Charles. So uh, people who don't know me, uh, my name is Paul Fussy, uh, with the State Troopers here, uh, sort of been running it, our folks here at the Incident Command Center. So um, we've had uh, five troopers during the day, five troopers at night. <coughs> so you guys have had more troopers here in that 10 mile corridor than the rest of the valley. So um, in order to get through the healing process and start looking at letting people back into the homes, 
We've gone over, like Norm said, two days. We've had safety experts going up and down the road looking at everything that could be or any prob probabilities. Uh, but my local troopers will still be here. Um, you won't have five troopers here in this area anymore, but my local troopers will be here. Um, so local troopers during the day and local troopers at night. So um, the way you worded it, we're pulling out? Uh, no, because our local troopers are always here. You just won't have the amount that you have been having. Uh, the National Guard um, probably will be uh, demobilized, uh, but we, with the highway, uh, like I said, it's been two-day process, multiple meetings, talking to all the entities, looking at safety officers, and they've been going up and down the road, and they're the experts. And DOT um, has been working with us. Um, Tammy over at QAP has been going over a lot of things too. Uh, but uh, like Norm said, we're at the point, the safety experts have looked at the highway uh, night and day, and um, they feel that uh, we can begin to open the road to two ways. Now, it's gonna be a trickle process um, when this happens. As you know, we've had four checkpoints. Um, the two in the center will probably be uh, demobilized first, and then it's gonna be a slow faucet. And my trooper's gonna be here um, for quite a while until we figure out that this is working and making sure everything's uh, where we need it. We might have to adjust a little bit, uh, some signage, um, some of the windbreaker signs that you guys put up, we'll take a look at it. See if we need to adjust it, um, but it's going to be a slow trickle process. It's not at noon; it's a wide open. It's going to be slow faucet opening up, and uh, to make sure it's a smooth transition as possible. And then we'll work on uh, uh, tomorrow. But that's the process for today: is a slow trickle opening of the highway. And I can't thank the residents enough who um, have been in there, um, who did not evacuate. Um, they've been waiting at their driveways and at the roads and everywhere else waiting for the pilot cars. So the folks, uh, the community here have been phenomenal. So, but it's a slow opening process because um, I know a lot of the locals have been stuck in two mile, three mile lines trying to get back and forth to work or trying to get uh, their supplies that they need. So opening the highway up is a first step and it's a slow process. So I hope that answered your question. Do they have any plans that if, if it becomes an emergency situation where we get, for instance, high winds or these fires pick up? I live back in Caswell and we have one road, and there's a lot of people back there. There's other places. There's uh, Cassie Sitna, which is a very large community, as well. There's so many of these places that are large communities. If there's a natural disaster. Is there somebody that's going to be able to be here right away to help if we, have, if we need to go through what we just went through? We'll get the troopers back up just like we do on Saturday and Sunday. Are they going to be able to patrol down the highway or up in the bigger neighborhoods to the... Um, You'll have our local troopers here. Okay, so they will be patrolling? Yes. Okay. Yeah, like I said, the main group of us are, are leaving, but <coughs> you guys have always had local troopers here. Uh, we're not shutting down the local trooper post. Um, the local troopers will still be here. Thanks for that, Bussy. And then we're adding for the fire team at, uh, part of it, we're adding security of our own for our operations along the highway. Now that the trooper presence is moving to other parts of the state, we will have our security um, like we normally do at a fire operation. We have law enforcement uh, from different agencies that come in, and they are folks um, who know this type of operation, know what to look for, protect our staging areas, protect access points to our crews. Okay. Okay. Uh, how about a couple more questions? I know we're, we're right at the hour mark, and uh, let's go to some folks who haven't asked one yet. Yes, sir, and then the man in the back. Uh, any resource for the hazardous trees on uh, property we own, lots, land? Meaning how to get them down. So the question was... Get them down. How do we get them down now that, uh, that we're going to have a big field but we're going to have? <laughs> right, so the question from the gentleman is on private land with all these fire weakened trees, how to get them down. And you know, one thing that's going to happen, they're naturally going to come down, yeah. right? Yeah. So that's gravity wins, and that's why it's an issue for us. Gravity kills. Right. And, um, and then there's that clearing and the heat sources underneath, creating the jack straw. This is going to be an ongoing. This is one of those things when we don't have moisture in the future yes. to help us out and help you out. This is going to be a long-term oh, yeah. challenge. So for the short term, though, while we're here, and we'll be, I mean, like I said, there's going to be firefighters here for a while. 
if it's a if it's a life safety thing like a structure threat or a or public or firefighter safety yeah if it's if we'll take care of those while we're here that's our mission uh, if it's outside that that's something that I think each homeowner is going to have to evaluate and there's there's companies that do that type of work I can we can probably get a list of those but as far as the, the safety part of it that's what Karen and her folks are doing out in the field right now and, and one comment if I can Norm three lifetime fires right three once in a lifetime fires. yeah when are we going to get ahead of these things in the future where we have where the resources are in place because we're talking about a very small area in the state this year that's burning maybe the most ever but still a very small area in the state that impacts structures and tourism and industry and and all those things to make life <coughs> what it is when, are, when is there going to be the resource uh, I don't know if it was Saturday night. I think it was Saturday night about 9 o'clock, 9.30. There was five helicopters. They disappeared. There was three planes. They disappeared. And that's when the fire was all on the east side of the road. So I can answer some of that. So this summer, it wasn't a small. I mean, it, the entire state was on fire. From the Brooks Range down to the Aleutians, it, there was fire. And we had uh, we burned over 2.5 million acres. We had, had almost 700 fires this year. It's a big year. So we were stretched thin. So we're never gonna have enough resources in the state at any given time for a season like that. So we have mechanisms in place to bring people in from the lower 48 and help. And then when they need our help, usually this time of the year when we're getting rain, we go down and help them. So that's just a national program that we have to support each other. Um, I will say on Saturday, we had winds of 35 miles an hour. We could not fly. It was unsafe for the aircraft. So they were grounded on Saturday. So our tankers were grounded. The helicopters were grounded. As soon as they dropped down on Monday, we had everything flying that we could, and then they went back to work. So that's probably why I saw them Saturday, disappeared for the big day, and then came back again. It was just that those wind, good wind conditions. Good question. Uh, uh, real, uh, real Ma'am in the back. Yes, uh, is going, going back to our home. Sorry, uh, I was asking for the man in the back first, and then we'll get to you, sir. In the in the uh, blue sweater, who is? There's, a, there's been a fire truck just east of the railroad tracks on Jimmy Hills, and I passed that. How do you safely pass your equipment on a two-way road without? How do I know I'm not going to run into you and cause you more trouble going past? Okay, great question. So. Again, another very concerned local. We appreciate that. The question is, how do you safely pass fire apparatus? In fact, I'm going to bring Karen in here because she, as a chief of all operations, she worries about each and every resource out there, and we're grateful that you're asking those questions and worrying about them too. This is the stuff that keeps her up at night. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, the, the biggest thing is speeds right now. So if uh, you're on those any of those side roads, is drive with your lights on and drive slowly and on those narrow roads and i know that that road is a narrow road uh, the for folks to be passing each other they're each going to have to give way a little bit so, so it's if I'm approaching a fire vehicle with their lights on i should stop how do i know you're not going to run out in front of me and i'm going to run into you I guess because because we, well one we don't we don't run out until we check the roads uh, do they have the lights on if they're sitting they have the lights on just so that other people can see them because when it is smoky uh, they want to be visible so that's why they have the lights on all the time and uh, so just slow down and just take a look our folks aren't running back and forth um, and so just take it real slow as you pass them thank you okay great thanks gentlemen in the back sorry your, your, your turn now go ahead uh, I, what I was talking about is, uh, when I go back home, my primary or east door to wood stove with a fire ban on that you know, when it's gonna be lit through where am I gonna be? Wood stoves aren't part of the burn restrictions right now. Their wood stoves are, are locked. Okay. I understood all bars and tables so I'll check down the chat about the shelf that uh, that's like external, like they're talking like the you know, you like to see like the Home Depot fireplaces, that commercial type stuff you see outside. Those are under restriction, but inside wood stoves are, are not. Yep. Okay, a couple more questions, and then we'll do breakouts. I thought we had one over here on the...
know a lot of people can't afford to rent a chipper or a lot of people can't or don't have a lot of them that are available. But maybe we can get some resources to try to individual property owners start getting rid of our fuels on our property <coughs> that are hazards. Okay, so to repeat the, uh, the statement, and it's also a suggestion and a very good one and one we all believe in deeply, which is community resilience, firewising a community, and the, the speaker was asking if the, if the assembly members could consider a shared piece of equipment like a chipper or some sort of force multiplier for firewising to remove fuels. And uh, I'm a huge fan of that. Drive by my place at 73, I asked my neighbor if I could cut two acres of his down or his dead sockeye trees just to show everybody you can do this, you can brush whack the highway, you can make your area safe for your family, but it takes work and not everybody has the manpower, time, and energy to do it. And I agree that when communities come together and in parts of fire affected California, Arizona, and all those states that have been living through this decade after decade, they've actually done exactly that and become certified firewise communities. And they can proudly put that sign up. But guess what? It's not a one year thing because everything's still growing. So they have to revisit that and revisit that. So it's, it becomes part of our culture, hopefully. And oftentimes, as survivors, you become an advocate for it. So thanks for that. And I know that Tam's saying yes for, okay, one more. Oh, from the online audience. Yeah, so I know that the uh, road was touched on, um, but to reiterate for our online audience about school buses traveling through the fire affected zone and the safety of that. Okay, so yeah, and school did, uh, the principal of schools here in the area did put off their um, opening of school for the fire operations, not just because we're using the school for community meetings, but because there's a whole lot of impact for those kids and, and, and Norm can address the next steps there. So we've been, we do our cooperator meetings. Who did ask? Oh, you closed <coughs> online, sorry. We do our cooperator meetings um, and the school district's been coming every day. So the plan is the teachers are coming back Monday to assess the school and kind of get ready for the uh, kids coming back. They'll, they'll have it on their website, and on Monday is when we'll have the final decision, but and I don't have the stop, so I won't give you bad information, but the plan is to have a stop north and a stop south, not within the fire area, so people have to move their, take their kids to those locations, mm -hmm. uh, and, they, and they're, they're working on where those will be and what that'll look like, but the intent is to get them through the fire area without having to stop in that smoky condition, and they'll have more information on that uh, Monday. Okay, great. And we'll stay for breakouts. Um, there is there one more pressing. Is it for everybody? Good one. Go ahead, ma'am. When a fire starts, do they sit right away? Boy, that's an angel question that goes back to the 1910 Great Burn, right? The big burn. When a fire starts, they get it right away. That's called initial attack. And in fact, on this fire bust, usually fires come in clusters when they're this type of impact. I, and Norm can speak to exactly how the initial attack went. The smoke jumper program in the United States of America is a leading uh, program that everybody in the world is envious of because we got really good at it. We got really good at putting out fires really quickly. And then there was some um, unintended consequences out over the last 80 years of fuel buildup in the woods. And so, so to your question, we do try to get on fires very quickly and get them out very quickly. And then we have this enormous fuel buildup all across the United States and Alaska where fires are going to get away from us because they haven't burned in a, in a, in a normal fuel regimen or return cycle, which there's a healthy return cycle, and then there's us saying we're putting everything out. So after 1910, this is just to give you the straight talk history of how this actually happened, and I'm not dancing around you. This is why we got really good at putting out fires right away, and then this is partially why fires grow so enormously, because they have been put out. And we got on this stuff right away because we were at indices where we knew, I mean, we've been out since since May, we've been all around the state with Norm's team. We've been in Delta Junction putting out fires, down in the Kenai putting out fires, up in Fairbanks for the old Murphy Dome Road community in Goldstream, and then up in the Chalkitsik village with Beaver, Venati, and all those areas, 600,000 acres on fire. And then this fire bus came, and it was so, another initial attack. So I'll, I'll give you my straight talk, too. So I think you're talking about, like, in your community, is that what you're... you're so we have, the way the state of Alaska is broken up is in several, several different management options. So where we have communities like, like this, the Matsu Valley, Anchorage, Kenai, it's under critical protection, which means aggressive initial attack. So we will, so we have resources here. The forestry has helicopters, tankers, uh, wildland firefighters. We have two crews, all based in Palmer. So when we get a new start in the valley, they come from the forestry side. 
and we work real closely with the borough and all their fire departments and you're familiar with those up and down the highway where they send their resources we send our resources we work together at some point in a fire like this operational control goes back to forestry by statute we we have that but we still work closely with the borough on that at the initial attack it's all hands on deck we work together we train together um, every spring we, our folks are doing simulations to practice for that so that's how we prepare for these starts um, so that so on the Saturday where this happened I think they had 14 fire starts that day uh, they caught most of them at under an acre which is what we try to do two of them got large this one and then the, the one in the Deshka. and again it's just a matter of you know resources and getting spread thin but, but uh, that's how that normally works um, so that's so yeah we, we throw everything we can at a fire in these conditions they staff up for that Ken had his folks on you know paid to be at the station ready uh, forestry augmented their staff with additional people so there was a larger than normal contingent of firefighters ready to respond it was just too many starts with, with uh, even for that amount of people okay great let's go to the breakouts and uh, we'll Dale, still look at those go comments. Go one, more yeah. one more I'm so sorry this is called a go back this is a go back back go back 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 I make that up <laughs> um, so I want to answer the question about what you had asked. I was trying to get that uh, Casey Cook, our emergency manager, uh, we've been working back and forth here. So he, um, uh, first of all, also we do have, there's Bill, two caseworkers. Yes. So we do have two caseworkers here, and I highly recommend before you leave here today to get with them, and they will answer a lot of your questions. Where do you go from here? What's coming next, okay? So... I'm reading what Casey sent me. Um, here's what he recommends highly, and you'll probably hear this from the caseworkers. When you go out to your homes, take pictures before you do anything else. Document everything, bunch of pictures, okay? Anything you purchase or do, keep all the receipts, okay? And then uh, uh, if FEMA comes in and it's gonna help you rebuild, generally, it's been up to about 34,000 in the past. Doesn't mean that's what's gonna happen, we're just giving you a ballpark, okay? So it'll be up to $34,000 generally. Um, and then there's also a state program uh, that, that uh, we're working on now to also apply for and the state's applying for FEMA assistance. So the main thing is document, document, and document. Everything you do, take pictures now, take pictures when you're clearing it, as you're doing it, and then as you're building, take pictures, okay? So that's what he's in here highly suggesting that you do. And uh, hopefully, if when FEMA if, if FEMA does come in and assist with this, then you generally you get up to about thirty four thousand dollars is what they give. And uh, the caseworkers may have more information on this. And as we get information on this, I assure you, Casey Cook will be putting that on our website, working with forestries and the boroughs. So all that information will be posted. Okay, I hope that helps. Can I add one thing to that? Um, my husband and I had a our house actually exploded in 96, the day before the anniversary of the 64 <coughs> earthquake. Um, and I, one thing that's extremely important that I didn't think about till you brought that up was that um, we had insurance, but we were $100,000 underinsured. Um, we weren't in a situation where it was a huge thing. It was just our home and our neighbors, and so we didn't have assistance like that. But we had our insurance. We. You think you have insurance and you think, okay, they're just gonna hand me my money. No, I've got, still have seven binders. They're probably three inches thick of pages in little plastic sleeves and it's front and back full of things. You have to go to the store and you have to write down. Okay, I had toothpicks. I used 20% of those toothpicks and you have to depreciate it. Your jeans. I had jeans from when I was in high school that were in great shape because I took good care of my clothes. I thought, okay, they're, you know, 50% used. Oh no, they're, they're only good for so many years. But you have to write everything down. Keep a list of that, whether you have insurance or do not have insurance. Because what you don't get assistance with, you can write off on your taxes. Okay, so that's a, the, the message is to be very, very, very thorough. It's now uh, 1125. We're gonna stick around for all your individual questions. Please catch Norm soon because he needs to get down for the midday command and general staff meeting, and then the rest of us can stay here a little bit longer for you. And thanks to our online audience. Thanks to Byron. That's a lot of signing. 
and Rachel and Myron too, helping them out, right? Yeah. For the deaf at home. And then for you at home, we, if you have more questions, uh, yeah, Emery, we can go right into it. Online audience is uh, well taken care of on the question front. Okay. Cool. Thank you. Ding.